many people, car setups are difficult to grasp, and it can be a nightmare to try and wrap your head around what needs to change with all the different moving parts. We have already done a three-part in-depth Seto Corsa Competizione setup guide on the Traction channel. However, what if you just don't have the time to go through all of that at the moment, and you just need a quick fix for a specific problem? Well, one of my colleagues at Traction had the great idea of doing a troubleshooting guide, effectively running through all of the most common issues you might have with your car's behaviour and giving you some suggestions on what to change in your setup to combat these issues. Now there is one important thing to bear in mind throughout this video. Given all the variables that can affect how a car behaves on ACC and the complex nature of setup work, you have to remember that my suggestions are exactly that. Suggestions. You can never exactly predict how one change might affect the overall behaviour of the car, because of course one change can then have a knock-on effect, leading to changes in other areas that you didn't intend. And these changes can be positive or negative, so it's about trying things one by one that should in theory help the car, and working out which change has the desired effect and therefore where in the setup the problem lies. Right, now that I've explained things a bit, let's get on with it. The first thing you need to do is make sure there are no fundamental issues. If you are off the pace you would normally expect to be at but the car feels generally okay, make sure you haven't missed any of the obvious lap time killers. For starters, how much fuel are you running? The difference between a hot lap on low fuel and a full fuel run can be as much as 2 seconds a lap. Also check that you haven't accidentally changed your engine map. Weather conditions are another thing that can play havoc on your lap time. Not only does heat make a big difference, but wind can as well, and it's easy to miss. A high velocity crosswind can make your car feel really unstable through fast corners, whereas a tailwind or a headwind will affect straight line performance. If your big rival in the same car is achieving a higher top speed than you, make sure you check that it's not just the wind. As for the aforementioned heat, well, ambient and track temperature changes can also have a huge impact on lap times, up to 2 seconds a lap yet again. The final general and fundamental time killer is tyre pressures. I'm always banging on about this, so much so that we even made a full video on it. Go and check that out by the way. But tyre pressures are another big lap time killer that can affect the car in all sorts of different ways. Make sure your tyres aren't simply under or over inflated. Ok, so you have the right engine map and you aren't over fueled, the weather conditions are fine and your tyres are within the pressure window, yet you are still slower than you expect to be. Or maybe the car just isn't handling as it should. Now it's time to start troubleshooting. Let's start with an obvious one, you are slow on the straights. The main area to look at here would be your aero settings. The most obvious issue is running too high a rear wing, so reducing this by a few clicks should make you faster on the straights at the cost of some rear end aero stability through the corners, but sometimes too much wing can make you slower through the corners anyway, so it's always worth lowering it and giving it a try. Ride heights also have a big impact, and this one's a little bit more complicated because it's not just about the overall ride height, it's also about the ride height balance from front to rear. In general, lower ride heights give you faster straight line performance than higher ride heights due to less drag. However, as soon as you start mucking around with the ride heights and aero balance, you're going to be affecting the whole car in many different ways beyond straight line performance, so please take this into consideration. Also remember that car choice can have a bigger influence on straight line speed than your setup, so sometimes you've just got to kind of deal with it and accept a compromise. Now the big one, cornering. Let's take this stage by stage, starting with the braking phase. If your car feels unstable when you hit the brakes, there's a good chance it could be either your brake bias or your dampers causing the issue. Generally, an overly rearward brake bias can cause instability under braking and turn-in, so increasing your brake bias number will move the bias towards the front and therefore increase stability. As for the dampers, well, adjusting your slow bump and rebound settings will affect the speed of the weight transfer under braking. Lowering these will result in slower shifts, which might help you with stability but also make the car less responsive, so depending on the nature of your stability issues, try adjusting these to suit. Maybe your car is stable under braking but you just aren't quite getting slowed down as quickly as you'd like. I'll start by coming back to the brake bias. If your bias is set too high and is therefore too far forward, you aren't fully utilising the stopping power of the rear tyres and brakes, so dialing it back a little bit can help with this. This change will also have a massive impact on turn-in, which I will come to shortly. As you can imagine then, it's about finding a sweet spot between stability and efficiency. It's also worth checking your brake compound choice and brake duct settings. If the brakes are too hot or too cold, then they won't work efficiently, so make sure you haven't selected the wrong compound, and then ensure you have the appropriate amount of cooling. There are plenty of other things you can look at if you want to increase your stopping power, maybe your ABS is set too high for example. Try it as low as you can get away with without locking up when you're fully pressing the pedal. It's also quickly worth checking that your pedals are reaching the full 100% mark in-game as they are in real life. Oh, and make sure your in-game brake power setting is at 100% as well. Ok, so now it's time to move on to the corners themselves. The first problems you might be hitting here are during the turn-in. You might be suffering from either turn-in understeer, where the front of the car doesn't want to enter the corner, or you might be suffering from turn-in oversteer, where the back of the car is so desperate to enter the corner it tries to overtake the front of the car. 
The following setup changes tend to tip the scale from one side to the other, so I'll just run through the main settings that will affect this, and of course which way you should adjust it in order to try and reduce understeer or oversteer. As there are quite a few changes you can make, it's about finding the ones that create the least amount of problems in other areas of the lap. If you're fairly new to setup work, then I'm afraid it comes down to trial and error, until you get enough of an overall understanding as to how each element works in harmony. Within the tyre setup screen we can try adjusting the front toe. Increasing this will give you a little more stability on turn-in, and therefore less oversteer. Lowering this can give you less understeer. Moving to mechanical grip, there are plenty of changes that can be made here. The aforementioned brake bias adjustment can have a massive impact. Increasing your bias and moving it forward will reduce any oversteer on turn-in, whilst decreasing your bias and moving it rearward will reduce understeer. Stiffening or increasing your front anti-roll bar can also help reduce turn-in oversteer, whilst decreasing or softening your front anti-roll bar can of course reduce turn-in oversteer. Understeer. Can reduce understeer. When it comes to aerodynamic changes, it's all about balance from front to back. If your front aero variation percentage is high, then the car has more grip at the front, whilst a low or negative number means that the car has more rear grip. Front focus setups tend to cause oversteer, whilst rear focus setups tend to cause understeer. Therefore, lowering the front ride height and or increasing the rear ride height will reduce turn and understeer, and as you can imagine, changing these in the opposite direction will have the opposite effect. Understeer can also be caused by running too high a rear wing setting, which gives the rear too much grip and takes away grip from the front. So. Reducing your rear wing might help get rid of understeer, whilst increasing it can reduce oversteer. We've all had enough of the words understeer and oversteer by this point, so I'm going to move it on to the next phase, which is mid-corner car behaviour. There are a number of issues you can suffer from mid-corner that will cost you lap time, so let's run through them. One thing that can really hinder you is a lack of rotation in slow corners, where you feel the car just won't turn the way you'd like at the apex. I guess you could describe good rotation in a sense as controlled oversteer. I said the word again. I'm sorry. The way your car reacts in this situation is mainly influenced by your mechanical grip and damper settings, basically your suspension. Again, it's the front that has the biggest impact on this particular aspect. Although generally GT cars suit stiff suspension, softening the front slightly will make the car easier to rotate, and this effect is exaggerated when you're off the throttle and coasting. There are different ways of softening the suspension, and of course, depending on which element you soften, it will have a different counter effect on the car, so it's a case of trying them and seeing which is the best compromise. You can try lowering your front bump and rebound settings, the slow ones by the way, not the fast ones on this occasion. Or you can try lowering either your wheel rates or bump stop rates. Your bump stop range can also have an impact on rotation. Generally speaking you want this to be relatively low so that the yellow and red lines on the diagram are close together, giving you stiffer suspension. But again, if it's too stiff you will struggle for rotation, so increase this if need be. Another quick one for you, are you suffering from too much rear end sliding through the corners? If so, maybe your rear suspension is a little bit too stiff, so try softening this as well. The counter argument to all of this, of course, is that softening the suspension does take away from some of the pointiness and directness of the handling, so as per usual, it's about finding a compromise. You want it to be stiff enough to be pointy, direct and of course fast, but also soft enough to rotate well, so find the compromise that suits you best. But what if you want to keep the slightly softer suspension for good rotation, but you also want to make the car more pointy and agile? Well, there are other ways of doing this, some of which we've already covered when discussing corner entry. Lowering your brake bias will give you both agility and rotation, but at the cost of stability. Your preload differential can also be used to try and change the way your car behaves in this phase. Increasing it closes the diff, which could aid slow speed rotation on the throttle at the cost of potential high speed understeer, whilst opening the diff, or lowering the preload, can help you with your agility into the corners and rotation off the throttle at the cost of slow speed rotation on the throttle. Preload differential can get a bit confusing. There are so many ways in which the diff can affect the car, so it's well worth playing around with it to try and understand how it feels. Basically, it often comes down to, you can have A and B, but you can't have C, or you can have B and C, but you're going to have to give up A. And that's why you have unique setups for different tracks and of course different driving styles. Maybe someone's driving style needs rotation and agility with a lack of stability, whilst a specific circuit might require more stability and agility without needing emphasis on strong off-throttle rotation. You get the drift. We've covered corner entry and mid-corner issues, so what about corner exit? The common problems you will encounter here are understeer, oversteer, or a straight-up lack of traction. The latter can be controlled by various elements of the setup. The simple ones include traction control and engine maps, which can be found in the electronics tab. Increasing your TC will limit traction loss at the cost of potential acceleration if it's limited too strongly. You can also use a different engine map with a more gradual and less aggressive throttle map, and this can also save you fuel. Your rear suspension will also affect your traction coming out of corners, so although it's good to have a stiff setup, softening the rear a little bit by either increasing the bump stop range, lowering the wheel and bump stop rates, or lowering your slow bump and rebound settings might help in this area. 
it's also worth taking a look at your rear anti-roll bar. Stiffening this by increasing the number might help reduce understeer on corner exit, while softening it might help reduce any oversteer. Rear wing can influence this too, especially out of the fast corners as less rear end downforce can encourage the back end to become a little unstable as you straighten up. Finally, just make sure those preload differential changes you made earlier to fix your mid corner problems aren't causing your corner exit problems. So we have now covered straight line speed, braking, corner entry, mid corner and corner exit. You should now have the tools to deal with at least 80% of the problems you will encounter when setting up a car. Now let's deal with the other 20%. Maybe your car is struggling over curbs. This could be down to ride height, so make sure you aren't too low and simply bottoming out as you go over them. If ride height isn't the issue, you can make damper changes in order to try and improve things. Increasing your fast bump and fast rebound settings will make the car stiffer over curbs, effectively making it less bouncy. If your issue is that the car feels like it's on a knife edge, then reduce these settings to make it a little bit softer and more forgiving. Are you struggling specifically with tyre wear and temperatures? If it's just general heat and wear that is consistently bad, this could be down to your tyre pressures, brake ducts or simply your driving style. However, if it's a specific part of the tyre that you're struggling with, i.e. the inside, middle or outside, then it could be influenced by your camber. If your negative camber is too extreme, it will heat up and wear the inside of the tyre much faster than any other section. Try bringing your camber slightly up and closer to zero to alleviate this issue. In the opposite sense, if the outside of your tyres are getting too hot and worn, it would suggest that the car needs more negative camber to try and balance it out. Maybe you don't like the feeling of your steering wheel when you're driving and this is costing you lap time. In terms of setup, the two things to try changing are your steer ratio and caster settings. A higher steer ratio will make your car's front wheels turn more relative to your steering wheel, so this might make it feel a little bit more pointy, but less smooth. Changing your caster will influence the speed of the self-centering, as well as the perceived weight of the steering. In all honesty, however, I would leave this as the default and adjust force feedback settings instead, whether that's through the game or your own wheel software. Also, just make sure that your rotation settings in the software match your in-game steer lock settings, as this will affect the natural feel of the steering as well. My final troubleshooting tips are for wet weather. Now, a normal dry, fast setup will be probably a bit unstable, unpredictable, or even dangerous in the wet weather. Here are a few things you can do with the setup to help that. Softening your suspension and dampers might help make the car more drivable. Also, make sure you adjust your tyre pressures accordingly, and to find out more about this particular element, check out our tyre pressure guide. Whilst we're talking about tyres, if your tyres in the wet are getting too cold, you can actually try increasing the toe settings as more friction will create more heat in the tyres. Another way of keeping heat in both the tyres and the brakes is of course decreasing the brake duct size as mentioned earlier. Staying on the aerodynamics page, a higher rear wing will help stabilise the car into and through the corners, but in turn if this gives you too much understeer, you can always try raising the rear ride height to give your front tyres a little bit more bite. Another way to do this is to decrease the brake bias a little bit. This will allow the rear tyres to do more of the work slowing down, as I mentioned earlier, which will, in turn, give your front tyres more lateral grip on corner entry. The final and more obvious changes for wet weather are the electronics. Add TC and ABS if you're struggling to keep the car on the road, although you want these as low as you can get away with if you're looking for ultimate lap time. So that finally concludes our ACC troubleshooting setup guide. If you found this useful, make sure you let us know down in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to the Traction channel and hit the notification bell for more Assetto Corsa Competizione help and advice. Until next time, keep it pinned, thanks for watching, and have a great day.